We'll do it live! Hi folks, and welcome to an OA Labs Patreon exclusive tutorial. Today, Applied Emulation, the second module where we begin to talk about the Unicorn CPU emulator. So if you watched our previous tutorial, you'll know how an emulator is built under the hood, how it works, and you will have created your own simple emulator for a few instructions. Having done that, I think you can probably now appreciate how much work goes into building a full-fledged emulator. So if we want a workable emulator that actually implements the instruction set, doesn't have terrible performance, what are we gonna do? Well, that's where Unicorn pops up. Hey, so if you're seeing this, it's because you're watching this tutorial on YouTube or Twitter X, I guess now it's called X. So I'm gonna take a minute to shill for our Patreon. If you like this tutorial, if you like what you're seeing here, go check it out. There's a lot more like this. We have examples, labs to do that accompany the tutorials, all that good stuff. So if you like this, go check it out. So Unicorn, in their own words, is a lightweight, multi-platform, multi-architecture CPU emulator framework. And here is the troll slide. Remember I mentioned before that Unicorn is basically the foundation for all these user mode emulators. Well, the troll here is that Unicorn is actually based on Kimu. <laughs> so in fact, Kimu is the foundation of pretty much every modern emulator that you're gonna be using for reverse engineering. It's all based on the Kimu instruction set. That is because the Kimu folks did a lot of work implementing these instruction handlers. So Unicorn, based on Kimu, multi-architecture, x86 is pretty much just all we're focused on, but it handles multiple ones. It has a very good API, very easy to use API. I think that's why everybody uses Unicorn. The API is easy to use, it's well-documented, easy to implement. Then there's a couple more pats on the back here that Unicorn talk about, but the main thing here is that they have a just-in-time compiler. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that they can run parts of the emulated code at native speed. Now, how this actually works under the hood is they have two components, one called the tiny code interpreter and one called the tiny code generator. And basically what these do is these lift the emulated code, the target code that you're trying to emulate, they lift it up and compile it down for the CPU that is actually running underneath the emulator and they run natively on the CPU, just like virtualization. So with this, Unicorn claims you can get near native speeds. That's not even remotely true. However, you do get a lot faster emulation, a lot faster. Um, you can do stuff in a reasonable amount of time. It, it doesn't take forever. If it was just a pure emulator, you would have to worry about some speed impacts. Now, the important thing to keep in mind about the jitting, which is where all the speed in, in Unicorn comes from, anytime you have a hook or something that can't be compiled down to native code, the emulator needs to pop back out, out of native code execution and into the emulator. And each one of these callbacks or each one of these returns from native code can slow the emulator down considerably. So one thing to keep in mind is if you are implementing a lot of hooks in, in Unicorn, if there's hooks are being called a lot, if there's a hook that's being called, say, every execution, you basically remove all of the speed benefits of the JIT. The JIT is only going to work if there are code blocks, basic blocks that can be executed in their entirety on the native CPU. All right, so as long as you watch out for that, you should be able to run Unicorn reasonably fast. So let's talk about the glorious Unicorn API. We're gonna be using Python for it. It's basically self-explanatory, but there is one thing that you just have to keep in mind at all times when using uh, Unicorn via the API, and that is that the Unicorn emulator is a native binary that runs. And even though it looks like uh, an API which is interacting with the emulator, really what it is is just a set of commands that you send to the emulator and then the emulator runs and then returns back. So any errors that happen in the emulator, they're not inside of the Python runtime environment and they don't propagate back up very well. I mean, you do get errors out of it, but the call stack for the errors is not in Python. It's in the native binary. So that means troubleshooting unicorn errors can be kind of time consuming. But as long as you keep that in mind, the actual API itself is pretty straightforward. To instantiate Unicorn, you basically need to tell it what architecture you're using and what mode. 
So for this, we're just gonna be using x86, 32-bit. Now that you have the Unicorn instance set up, the next thing you're gonna need to do is create some memory for it. So to create memory within the emulator, you use the mem map command and use the mem write command to write to it. You can also use the mem read command to read from memory, but we'll talk about that later. So when you're setting up your emulator, a unicorn doesn't have the concept really of a stack. You have to set that up for it. It's better for you to control the stack than for a unicorn to try and set it up itself. So the way that we do this is we allocate some space for the stack. We create the mem map for it. In this example, we are just nulling out the stack. We're just writing zeros to the whole stack. And then the key point here, which went over in the previous tutorial, is that a stack is just a concept. And the only thing that makes a memory stack memory is the fact that you point ESP to it. So what we do here is we just assign the stack memory to the ESP register in Unicorn. Now to take note of something here, instead of putting the stack pointer at the top of the allocated memory, we put it right in the middle. Now you might be wondering, what's, what's the point of this? The stack uh, grows down, why don't we just use the whole stack? The reason why we put it in the middle, the reason why we do the stack size divided by two, and that's where the uh, ESP is set, is because when we're emulating, sometimes we grab code right in the middle of a function. And this means that the code expects the stack to be set up beforehand, and we're not actually emulating the stack setup code. This can happen. We try to avoid it, but it can happen. And when this happens, what it means is that the stack pointer might move negative as well as positive, right? Because the stack setup is not actually being emulated. So Unicorn will just happily run any instructions you pass to it. So if the previous code that you didn't copy into the emulator, you're not emulating, took into account some sort of move on the stack to say, make room for local variables. And of course you didn't emulate that code. So Unicorn doesn't move the stack pointer. It's very helpful to have that stack pointer start in the middle of the stack so that it has room to move up and down in case there was some stack setup that you didn't take into account. So that's just a handy trick that we use. And usually that'll handle most stack setup initialization errors. All right, now it comes time to set up our actual code. The way that we do this is very similar to the stack. We allocate some memory in the Unicorn engine, and then we write our code into it. So there's only one extra thing that we need to take into account here when we're creating our memory for our code, and that is to mark the memory as protect all. Now, all that does is allows the memory to be read, write, and execute, so you don't run into any sort of execution permissions errors with Unicorn. You can actually designate all of the memory as protect all, doesn't really matter. But the reason why I don't like to do that for the stack or data is that I like to see if there is some sort of error where it's trying to be executed. Usually it helps finding bugs a little bit easier, um, but you can mark them all as protect all if you like. But in this case, for the code, you have to mark it as protect all. All right, now that we have our stack and our code set up, all we have to do is start the emulation. Now, in addition to the first argument here for emu start, which is the beginning address where the emulation is actually going to start, we have three ways to halt emulation. So the second argument is an end address. So when Unicorn gets to that address, it's going to halt emulation. But we also have two optional arguments here, timeout and count. Timeout will stop the emulation if the timeout value in milliseconds has been hit, and count will stop the emulation if the instruction count that is passed has been hit. In this case, we pass zero to both these arguments because we're not gonna be using them, and zero just makes them inactive. So now that we have our emulator running, it's gonna run until it hits the halt state. So in this case, the only one that we are looking for is that end address. So in this case, we've used the target base plus the length of the code. So it's gonna run until it hits the address at the end of the code. Once it's done that, you wanna actually get something out of the emulator, right? And this is where the reading comes into play. You can do a reg read on any register and read the value from it. And you can do a mem read and read any length of memory from Unicorn. Now you might've noticed in the slides, this little Mega Man guy here beside me with the link. That is because one of my former colleagues, Alex Hanel, has a very good 
Git repo with documentation about how to use the Unicorn interface. So if you head over to that link, you can get a lot more instructions, a lot more detailed instructions on what we have in the tutorial here. So I'd encourage you guys to check that out if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the capabilities about Unicorn. But for now, I'm going to open up an emulator and we're going to jump into a small demo of using Unicorn. Okay, so for our demo here, we are going to be repeating the same emulation that we did in the first module for emulating our add shellcode. But in this case, we're going to be using Unicorn instead of writing the emulator ourselves. So to get started here, the first thing we need to do is actually set up Unicorn. So since we know that the code is x86 and it's 32-bit, we'll be setting up Unicorn as architecture x86 and mode 32-bit. You'll see a very close similarity to the disassembly engine that we set up in lab one for capstone. Uh, for emulation, you also need to specify the architecture and the mode. So let's copy this down into our workspace down here, where we're actually going to be reading in the add shellcode and emulating it. So we can just paste that in here. And this is actually the unicorn emulator setup. There we go. Now, once we have the unicorn engine set up, the next thing we need to do is give our emulator a stack. So anytime we want to use Unicorn to emulate some code, we're going to need to allocate some memory inside of Unicorn for the stack. And we're going to need to tell Unicorn that this is the stack by assigning the stack pointer to point at that memory. So let's copy this code here into our workspace and I'll go over it quickly for you guys. So we are going to set the stack base at one and five zeros hex and we're gonna give it a size of one and five zeros hex. This is a large stack. You usually won't need to assign such a large stack. I'm just doing this so that you have a large amount of, you can hear the doggo sleeping beside me. I'm just doing this so you have a large amount of space to work with in case you wanna emulate something else that needs a big stack. Now, as I mentioned in the slides, when we're setting up a stack for shellcode emulation, I usually like to place the stack pointer in the middle of the stack. So by dividing the stack size by two and adding that to the stack base and then setting that as the stack pointer, I have ensured that the stack pointer starts in the middle of the stack. And again, the reason for this is so that if the stack needs to actually go negative or needs to grow into the positive address space, that's possible. Whereas if you started the stack at the very top of the address space for the stack, you wouldn't have room for that to move around. Now, under normal execution of a program, the stack setup and teardown for each function will ensure that that never happens. However, because we are sometimes emulating code that we copy from the middle of a function, the stack initialization may not be emulated inside our emulator. So we have to ensure that our stack pointer can move both up and down. So once we have the stack pointer address, we have the base of the stack address and the size, we can use the memory map command to map some memory into the unicorn emulator. And of course we map it at the stack base and the size of the stack. I also like to ensure that the entire memory is nulled out. Now unicorn usually does this by default, but I like to do this just so that I am 100% certain that the memory is going to be nulled out. Troubleshoot crashes, you can also write a repeating pattern into the stack. And so when you have a crash, you can look at that pattern in the stack where the crash occurred and identify where that is in the stack. But that's something more advanced if you were doing some fuzzing or some vuln hunting using Unicorn. Now, once we have mapped that memory into Unicorn and we have nulled it out, the last thing to do is take our calculated stack pointer address and assign it to the ESP register inside of Unicorn. Now Unicorn has its own registers and these can all be addressed using these constants. So UC underscore the architecture reg and then the name of the register. And all we have to do is use the reg write command to write our address for the stack into the ESP register and our stack should be set up. 
One of the key takeaways from this, in addition to the fact that we have to set up the stack, is these three commands, the mem map, mem write, and reg write commands to map memory into the emulator. So this is like an allocate command, you're allocating memory. The mem write, which is to write to that memory, and the reg write, which allows you to write a number to one of the registers inside of Unicorn. All right, so now that we have the stack set up, let's set up our code. Our code is set up pretty much identical to the stack. Again, remember memory is just memory inside of an emulator. So all we have to do is set up some memory where we can actually execute the code and make sure that that memory is executable. So let me copy this example into our workspace. And of course we don't need the code here because we've already copied the code from our add.bin file up here, right? So looking at the code memory assignment, we can see it works pretty much the same as the stack. We choose a base address for the code page. We choose a size. The size is enormous for a three instruction piece of shell code, but we just choose in a nice large size in case you wanna reuse this emulator for something else. We map the memory into the emulator but in this case, we do something a little different. We change the protection of the memory to protection all. This means that the memory is read, write, and executable. The reason why we do this is because we're going to be writing our code in there and we wanna make sure that it's executable. Once you become comfortable with Unicorn, you can choose the correct minimum privileges for each piece of memory you map into Unicorn. My suggestion is when you're starting out, just choose protect all so you don't run into any issues with the memory not being executable or readable or writable. Once we've allocated that memory inside of Unicorn, we null it out, same as the stack, and then we write our code into the memory starting at the target base. Now, of course, you don't have to start at the target base. You could write the code anywhere inside of that allocated memory, but by starting at the target base, we now know that the target base is also the entry point for our code. That's where we're going to begin execution inside of Unicorn, because that's where the code starts. So running the emulator, very straightforward. Let me copy this down into our workspace. All you need to do is start the emulator. The first argument is the address where emulation will start. Again, by using the target base, as the beginning of the code that we wrote into the executable memory, we know the target base is a good place to start the emulation. The target end in this case is going to be the end of the code. Now we don't have a target end at this point, we're going to have to create it. So what we wanna do for the target end is we wanna take the target base, so the beginning of the code, and we wanna add the length of the code that we're emulating. So now the target end will be the address at the end of the shell code. So now that we've created our target end, the second argument is self-explanatory. It's the address where the emulation will stop. We are not going to use the timeout or the instruction count in this case. So we're just using zero for that. If we press shift enter, we've now emulated the shell code. Nothing's happened because we haven't asked the emulator any questions. So what I like to do is I like to put a little print statement at the end of my emulation, right after the emulation start command, so that I know when the emulation is done. So I'm gonna print. All right, now if I press Shift Enter, I know that once I've got to the print statement, the emulation has completed. This is just a nice visual cue because this call is blocking, because basically Python will block here until the emulation is complete. By having the print done here, we know that once we're printing, the emulation has completed successfully, or we're gonna see an error on the screen. So now that we've completed the emulation, let's just take a refresher of what the shellcode actually does. You should remember from module one, but I'll just show you quickly in IDA here. So here we have our shellcode opened up, and you can see there are three instructions, move two into EAX, move three into EBX, and then add EBX to EAX, which stores the result in EAX. So after our emulation, we should expect two 
plus 3 in EAX, so we should expect EAX is 5. Let's go back and ask our emulator the value that's stored in EAX. Hopefully it's 5, and then we'll know that we have successfully emulated this code. So in our workspace here, let's do uc.reg. The register that we want to read is going to be EAX. So we can use this as a reference and just change ESP to EAX. And let's print that out to the screen. So actually, I'll save that to EAX. And let's print EAX to the screen. All right, there you go. We've completed our emulation and EAX contains the value five. So we know the emulation was completed successfully. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, just a quick reminder, go check out our Patreon. We have a lot more tutorials like this, hundreds of hours of live streams with us reverse engineering, and we have lab exercises that go along with these tutorials. If you wanna get some hands-on practice, go check it out. We'll see you in the next tutorial.